This panel is moderated by our own Elsa Berry, French American Chamber of Commerce President, President of Vendôme Global Partners, joined by Laurent Trouin, Managing Director and Head of Consumer Advisory Americas at BNP Paribas, Joseph Ferrara, Co-Founder and Co-Chief Executive Officer of Resonance, Ron Fresh, Operating Partner, Castanea Partners, and Peter Juppner, Executive Vice President, Strategy and New Business Development from the Estee Lauder Company, and last but not least, Virginie Morgan, Deputy Chief Executive Officer from Euraseo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. So, um, my challenge in preparing for this is even though it's one of the most interesting subjects for me, I wasn't sure whether um, many people in the audience would share my passion for uh, finance and helping brands grow and connecting and doing things called mergers, acquisitions, and divestitures. Um, and so I decided that I would um, enliven the subject by having fantastic people, including orange pants, to liven up the debate. So thank you, Virginie. <laughs> so we have a very um, diverse panel and different experiences and background. Uh, you have the bio, so I'll just start over there, we say, with Joe, co-founder of um, Resonance, an angel and early stage investor. Next, we have Laurent uh, Droin from BNP Paribas, that I think is one of the top global financial institutions. Uh, Ron Fresh, uh, former top executive at Sachs and Bergdorf Goodman, and now partner at Castanea, uh, based in the US. Uh, Virginie Morgon, um, currently based in Paris, soon to be based in New York with Eurasio. So an angel investor, an advisor, two private equity firms, one primarily in US and primarily in France, and then Peter Juppner, the real thing, Estee Lauder Company, the corporate. So um, a lot of different <laughs> <laughs> profiles. We're, we're not the real thing. <laughs> well, I was thinking about the perspective. Never mind. I'll, I'll talk about that later. Um, so all panelists obviously have an interest in luxury and investing in luxury, um, and all have views regarding the impact of innovation and technology on the growth path and the challenges and opportunities that that represents for brands. Um, we will be talking about how this shapes really the right financial partner profile given what we've heard since this morning about the fast changing landscape of the luxury industry and the even more demanding consumer that we all face today. So we will talk about smart money. Uh, we will also review if there's a right time, an optimal time for a brand to seek out a financial partner how investors who are overwhelmed today with opportunities uh, manage to select the right ones to spend time on and invest in. And then we'll talk about the time horizon that I personally feel, and I think many agree, is typically associated with the luxury industry, which is not an overnight um, segment and requires sometimes a lot of uh, time to develop. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the art of the deal, not the science, the art, which means there's not necessarily a black and white answer to everything. And then if we have time, we'll talk about exits. So, um, and for our purposes, we're gonna primarily focus on the small to medium sized market, about under 100 million. Uh, and the minute I say that, there are, many, there are exceptions. And the exceptions are, number one, Castanet has raised recently a bigger fund, and I think has a bigger appetite. Number two, Eurasio has a bigger appetite, and does far bigger deals, and also, is publicly listed and has long-term capital. And of course, Estee Lauder can do exactly what they want, <laughs> size-wise. So um, with that, um, I would like to start and ask you all to briefly answer the question, which is, at what stage of a company's growth do you typically invest? And um, what is your targeted equity check? And in a few brief words, what is your unique selling proposition? So I'll start with Joe. First, uh, thanks for uh, hosting, uh, Elsa. And, and I want to point out that today I am wearing Tommy John bright yellow underwear. <laughs> you are? Sure. Uh, Joe Farr, so uh, we started uh, Resonance Companies um, last year. Uh, Resonance invests in early stage um, uh, brands, and target check is 250 to $2 million. So we really are looking at growing companies um, that have proven traction we think of traction in terms of number of customers and customer connections. 
So when we see a brand with a thousand customers, we're actually looking and dissecting those thousand customers and the connection that the brand has with those customers. And we ask the question, can we add value? Can we create value by moving from a thousand customers to 10,000? And that arc from 1,000 to 10,000 customers is very specialized. It requires a lot of skills. Our special sauce or what we bring to the table is we bring the operations to the table, both front end and back end, to allow the brand to realize their vision of adding an incremental 9,000 customers on their then path to go from 10,000 to 100,000. Thank you. Laurent, you want to participate or? Yeah, uh, so it's more from the advisor and uh, but what we see, uh, what we, uh, <coughs> people are trying to get earlier in the growth stage. You know, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. That's a recent, not so much a recent trend, but that's uh, really something we've, we've seen across the board. Two comments, two comments around that, perhaps the same, uh, first in the sense that you should, you can and you should try to uh, catch new waves and trends earlier because those waves can be bigger and quicker. Mm -hmm. And the second one is also from a risk reward perspective because we're talking investing money here. I think the rewards in, in consumer luxury comes from the growth side. And there is a sense that you know it's easier to predict perhaps the growth from 25 million to 150 million than to do it from 150 to 500. So obviously with the size and the smaller size comes some you know issues. But I think we've seen people going for smaller deals while trying to mitigate the risk associated with that. Which also is in line with the technology that enables faster growth. Exactly. And so if you wait longer, you're really going to exactly. miss the boat. The waves are, yeah. you know, bigger, uh, earlier. So Ron, uh, well, thank you. Yes, yeah, so or you can take one on the table if you prefer. It's on. It's on. Hello. So we, we look at brands mm -hmm. at various stages. We, we will look at them at an early stage to begin to build a relationship and understand the quality of the people and the quality of the brand. For sure, we look at a brand that's at least proven something, you know, that, that they've, they've, they've been able to achieve something with an aspect of their business. And our involvement, while we get involved early, and many times on a mentoring basis, is to see if they can prove something other than the one thing that they've proven and it's gotten them on the radar screen. Our tendency is to um, then evaluate the organization, evaluate the talent. Um, we usually are investing in founder-based companies, so it's important to understand the creative talent as well if there's any operational talent within the, uh, within the group. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we are slightly later stage than uh, Resonance or Castaner. We would look uh, typically in investment of uh, you know pretty large span from 25 million to up to 400 million, which was our investment in Montclair. Um, we would certainly try to identify the potential as early as possible, but would not be able to invest too early, not having. Uh, probably the right expertise at the beginning to start, you know, scaling up the, um, the brands and, and the teams. What we would really bring would be the international ambition. That's what we brought to Montclair with, you know, significant steps um, being achieved, uh, notably in Asia. We have uh, also presence in um, offices in China and in Brazil. Um, and we would then, you know, we would then bring the ambition, the strategic vision, um, of course, the financial, you know, the, the capital. But for most of those companies, they, they can actually finance their growth um, by themselves. So they are not much looking for capital. They are much more looking for you know, experience, network, knowledge. Um, you know, the hire of talents for me is absolutely critical in, in, in what we do and what we bring to the companies. You, know, you make it right or you make it wrong with the right, you know, the right people. Um, and just you know, the ambition, you know, bring, bring the vision, bring the ambition and make it happen. Um, so on an international front, we bring, of course, our European expertise, being what we are for so many years, 130 years. And I think the permanent capital uh, helps. It's not, you know, it helps because it gives us the luxury of staying on board as long as you want, and also taking more risk in the ambition of building the brand faster, investing in stores if it's essentially wholesale. So we really try to see and assess what has not yet been done by you know, brand mm -hmm. and the management team that we can bring to them with our expertise. So 
uh, at Estee Lauder, we're really uh, brand builders. So we're not in the market to buy market share. Usually we don't do large deals, but we're really identifying smaller brands that we believe in. And as I always say, if we can't fall in love with the brand, we're not going to do the deal. Um, so it's smaller and mid-sized deals, probably 50 to $500 million. And our special model is that we are mostly also bringing the entrepreneurs uh, with us on board because we strongly believe that there is a strong connection between brand DNA and the entrepreneurs. And so therefore, um, we pride ourselves, at least in the beauty industry, to be the best home for entrepreneurs, and I think our history has proven that. Thank you. So now we have a question for the audience. Uh, the question is, um, what is the hottest trend or the top sector that you're interested in today? This is a one-word answer. It's more geared towards investors, but it's also interesting to know what is considered hot in terms of sector or trends. So I don't know if the question is populating. <laughs> you can't see. What's interesting is that there's no one major big word. It seems to be quite diverse. Ah, food, fashion, beauty, chocolate. <laughs> okay, now beauty, chocolate, fashion. Okay, uh, while we continue populating this, um, Ron or Virginie, do you have? <laughs> do you have any any trends right now or sectors that you're particularly looking at, or some that you used to look at and are less interested in? Maybe Ron, you want to start? Yeah, we're, we're pretty open. We we try to invest in, say, a more aspirational area. Uh, luxury is a tough zone right now, and um, <coughs> it needs a lot of years to make it happen. It uh, takes a lot of patience, and it's hard unless the luxury brand has already uh, captured credibility with multiple categories uh, to try to assume that they're going to be able to uh, uh, make um, a positive foray into additional categories is a pretty big leap of faith within the luxury arena. Within the aspirational arena, uh, it's a very interesting arena for us right now. The challenge, though, is to make sure that those brands that are thinking about uh, investment are brands that aren't waiting too long to think about it. Right, right. Which is one of the big challenges that we see, that it's, it, it, by the time many brands start thinking about it, they're pretty close to hit the wall. So it's very so, so what is the optimal time in your mind? What, it, what do it you? Depends, it depends on the brand, <coughs> but of it, course. it certainly is during the growth period. It, mm -hmm. It's not when that period is slowing down, mm -hmm. which is unfortunately when we, we hear from many brands right. that they're finally right. ready to take an investment. So you would say you're an aspirational, not absolute, and not accessible, more the middle category yeah, right now. Yeah, and also yeah. very interested in categories. You know, people who have brands that have been able to really develop a category of business that they're very strong in. Mm -hmm. Except, say, footwear. Are you wear. interested in men's underwear? Men's <laughs> underwear could be. We haven't done that, but you're always open, right? Virginie? Um, I mean, on luxury, yeah, I concur with, um, you know, with Ron. I mean, there's not um, that many opportunities. And if they are, um, usually, you know, we, we tend to assess our chances to mm -hmm. win because it's a competitive world. Right. And you may think, or you may have the knowledge that you know some of the large corporate groups would have greater in interest and, of course, greater financial power. Um, so you have to choose your battle. But there's not that many in you know pure luxury. I mean, you know, the areas in where we, we spend a lot of time these days is designer brands. Mm -hmm. And you know, what type of designer brands are we talking about? How long that can last? You know, what's unique in terms of proposal? And I think that's always. Because the answers are pretty soft, mm -hmm. you know, they come through, you know, perception of the brand, DNA, a real value proposal proposition, and it's it's not, you know, the question is out there. The answer is not that easy. But designer brand for me is, you know, is an area where there's been a lot of, you know, creativity um, over the last five, ten years, and that presents some strong investment opportunities. 
in, in cosmetics and you know makeup, um, we're spending a lot of time also identifying uprising, trendy or classic, but uprising brands. And you know, again, if uh, our dear friend from Estee Lauder or L'Oreal, I'm actually on the board of L'Oreal, you know, sh are, are there and are showing you know significant interest, you know, that wouldn't be my priority. <laughs> um, but in some cases, you know, the brand would not fit in in the portfolio of a L'Oreal or an Estee Lauder because they already have a brand which you know is in this positioning, and then you can play a role, or it's too small. Uh, at least L'Oreal doesn't target uh, two small companies, right. unlike Estee Lauder, which right. has been you know, doing smaller investment and able to nurture and grow uh, some businesses in its portfolio. But cosmetic and color cosmetic makeup, mm -hmm. for me, sh and there's a lot of opportunities, especially in the US, uprising brands, you know, West Coast, East Coast. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm astonished when you look at both you know, l affordable luxury and, and cosmetics, and you look at the growth over the last five, five years, probably even you know, six or seven, the growth has come from essentially new brands. Um, yeah. And I would say about two thirds of the growth is, c is coming from uprising new, new brands. Yeah, the indie brands, yeah. And, and that comes back <coughs> to the discussion we had this morning, authenticity, you know, surprising product, new product, new type of formula. Uh, new brand, and you know, um, is it is it related to the millennials? Probably, mm -hmm. but it, it, it's it's quite profound that, that trend, and I think yeah. that gives us, you know, us all opportunities to back those management team and those new brands for a certain period of time. Okay, uh, Joe, is there anything from the early stage side that stands out right now as? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. May maybe it's because we're so focused on early stage. Literally, thousands of brands are being born you know, uh, every six months. Yeah. And, and the fatigue, you know, the investor fatigue that yeah, we have, you know, right. we're, we're a, we have high stamina, so we, we live through all these, but um, you know, it's crowded out there. And so when Ron makes reference to uh, being category specific, you know, that word specific is really important to us. And so we're looking at brands that can, you know, finish the sentence, I make the finest, or I make the best. Mm -hmm. And there's demonstrated product um, expertise and executional skill to really, you know, um, uh, stand out in a category. So specific categories we're absolutely looking at, and we're looking for competency, core competencies in those categories from a very product-centric, um, you know, standpoint. Uh, areas like uh, printed textile, areas including full fashion knit, that kind of specialization where you can have core competency and make a brand stand out at an executional level, all the way from design through to execution, is real important to us. So, so obviously everyone in the audience, you know that we're talking here about smart money. And so before we go further into that topic, I'd like to ask again a questions to the audience. Um, and the first thing is, uh, what is the most important aspect or item that you as a brand would want a financial partner to contribute if they were to invest in your company? Network, big, contacts, customer acquisition, relationships, perspective, industry knowledge, best practices. It's really connections and operations stand out. Yeah. A 10 year plan. Oh, so does anyone here on the panel, are you prepared to do a 10 year plan? I am. Oh, okay. So that's what I said. Estee Lauder is different. So we'll, I'll shift around the questions and go straight to that. Um, I think most random people, if you were to ask, would agree that the ultimate smart money would have to be somehow corporations. But why? Because they're there, they're doing it, they're, it's their day and night bread and butter focus. Um, but what I, one question I have for you is typically corporations will wait a little bit longer and companies will go through the early stage, then they might find a private equity that's smart and can get them to the next level. And then after that, the corporation steps in. 
you stand out as having been immensely successful at identifying, buying, and nurturing small companies. So my question to you is, um, that's a fact, but do you think that uh, some of these founders in selling to you are selling because they're convinced that you're the smart money and the only one, as opposed to holding out and growing bigger and selling out for more later? Because you know the second bite of the apple is pretty attractive to many people. So what's the mystery, what's the secret sauce to say, like Joe, that you have when you, are you the ultimate smart money or is that not true, there's something else? Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, I would answer it in the, f in, in the following way. Um, if you would have asked me, Elsa, five years ago, mm -hmm. um, I would have said, well, we wait until there's a proven business model, you know, companies have 50, 100 million dollars in sales. Um, but I think what uh, we've done over the last couple of years, we've sort of gone back to the future. If you think about this or other companies, uh, a lot of our brands we bought very small. As a matter of fact, Mac, which today is a multi-billion dollar brand, was $30 million uh, in sales when we bought it. Uh, La Mer was an idea. It was actually not even a million dollars in sales. It's a lot more these days. <laughs> and so um, as we were thinking, we've actually been going back to uh, develop models where we can accommodate also smaller brands. And so this is not one size fits all, but we have a variety of different investment options for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And that can range from a minority investment uh, to uh, an earn out to a full takeover. Mm -hmm. um, we're very flexible in terms of you know, the, the desires of the entrepreneurs, what they want to do, if they want to stay on, uh, in what roles they want to stay on. And I think we bring a lot of what was uh, just on the board in terms of operations experience, network. I mean, you really have you know, a plug-in with us uh, that, that works very well. But how do you avoid killing them with a big corporate structure? Yeah. So that's, uh, again, a very good question. And so what we came up with uh, a couple of years ago is what I called uh, ELC Ventures, which is a team of people. This is not a classic venture fund, so we're not you know, trying to, you know, invest $500 million or a billion dollars. But it's really a team within the company which is a one-stop shopping for these smaller brands. So mm -hmm. they don't have to get lost in the corporation, but this is a very small, agile business team um, where uh, basically the entrepreneurs have a one-stop shopping and a single point of contact. And so ELC Ventures will navigate the Estee Lauder companies for these small brands. Mm -hmm. So it's obvious that you all contribute smart money. Is there anything else you want to add before we move on to the, we've talked a little bit about it so far. Um, so w why don't we go to another question to the audience, which is um, how we, what is the most important factor that you look at when you invest in a brand? Again, it's more oriented to buyers and investors. Just curious to see what, what is it that you're really looking at when you look at a brand before you invest? Quality management, profitability, image, growth potential. <coughs> profitability, <laughs> jump. Okay. So clearly it's people and, and profits and growth. Um, something unique. Um, just a quick question to Virginie and Ron. How do you decide where you spend your time? With, and, and maybe Joe, on all these investment opportunities. Is it people, is that really, the, or is it okay, they, they can finish the sentence as Joe says, or, or there's just something uh, y unique? I mean, it, it must be uh, a well, big. Th three things. Okay. Um, well, I just, you know, to, to be, sort of to summarize, but on the brand part, the product, the expertise, the uniqueness, the DNA, if there's heritage, what type of DNA. Uh, client perception, you know, going deeply into what, what is it really contributing, how unique it is, because the uniqueness helps you ascertain how long it may last, because the question is, you know, how long it may last, how fast can it go, mm -hmm. what, what can you, how can you transform? Then, of course, the financial, um, I mean, we would look at historical performance, meeting budget in historically, which gives you also a view on the type of management you have, know, are they over conservative or, you know, quite optimistic about, you know, mm -hmm. what they can achieve? 
uh, sell through promotion, you know, the real detail which of the financials but which show the quality of the brand, you know, how much the brand has been supported or not by promotion, sell through quality of the you know the doors, the wholesaler, so all that, you know, mm -hmm. analysis financial parts. And then of course the people. I mean yeah. the, the management itself, you know, the the, there's some management which are absolute genius or very, you know, very complete in terms of expertise and that makes a hell of a change. Yeah. Even if the brand and the financial are the same, you know, it's day and night, um, depending on who's heading the company, who is the creative di uh, you know, director, so of course people. So go ahead, Ron. Yeah, so we, we look at a very similar package what we look at, but I mean, it always begins with the product and the belief. I mean, you know, as someone said, it's, it's, it's the, the initial engagement, it's, it's not necessarily a science, it's that we know the zone of business that we're talking about. We know the competitive field. We have a pretty good sense of the, the, the wholesale client base and whether there is an existing direct-to-consumer, and we evaluate that. We do spend a lot of time with customers. We spend a lot of time with performance by door, quite frankly. We, we you know, honestly, I know most of the retailers we're talking to, so I get a lot of very honest and direct answers. You know, is the sell out like the sell in? Buy it by door? Is it an item business? Is it a collection business? You know, all of those which help us understand can the business scale? Does it, does it have an ability to scale? Mm -hmm. As much as the size of the business as we look at, I like to say that management is, is critical. Many times it is not. The creative component, quite frankly, is more critical because we find many times going through due diligence that we have to be very direct with going through this process that if the, the, the partner, the husband, the friend, whoever it is of the creative side is the, is the business person, we don't feel that business person is someone who's going to be the business person who's going to take this business where we want it to go, we will be very honest about it and say, look, we think you're great, we've done a great job up to now, but probably not an easy conversation. Yeah. A, a more quality person. This is the area where many of the brands we talk to are very solid. So, so we're, creative, we're prepared to support creative is key and, and not, not always just senior management creative. Yeah, yeah you, you know, especially, especially in early stage, um, you know, the rule in angel investing, and we carry it into early stage, is you're betting on people. There is no question in our mind you're betting on the entrepreneur. You know, when we're talking about building a fashion brand, you're betting on the creator. That is the entrepreneur. That is the entrepreneur at the center of the universe the creator as an entrepreneur, the creator as, as having essential talent to dominate in a product category and be meaningful. So it is people first, no question. Um, number two is customer, number three is product. But people first, customer second, product third. So we're gonna jump around because I see we have very little time left and I really wanted to get to a little bit of the art of the deal. I will jump through some of the questions for the audience and go straight to Laurent uh, because he is the master of the art of the deal. And really, we've been talking about finding the right company, when do you invest in it, how do you select it, early stage growth, rapid growth, valuation. So, what are, first of all, are there any luxury specific metrics? And I would expand that and say brand, because I think when you value a brand company, it's very different from a lot of regular businesses. And um, how do you also look at high growth companies? So those are two specific questions on valuations, and in the end, do corporations always end up paying the most or not? So those are your three questions to start. Okay. Uh, I think the first two questions are related yeah. because uh, the asset and the growth are related. Uh, so the metrics, in a way, it's, uh, it's going to be a weird answer. It's, it's not so easy to measure. Mm -hmm. uh, I would call it perhaps the pure purity of the brand equity, which has to do with the exclusivity, the desirability, the consistency of the vision. Uh, and obviously, you know, uh, it's intangible, but it's even tangible in a, you know, obviously, uh, hopefully, an EBDA of the company. But what we've seen, you know, recently is that it's not so much about having the highest EBDA uh, that actually gives the best valuation. It's an EBDA combined with a great brand, you know, purity, great brand equity, because it gives actually the, the buyer the ability get a, a very clear vision about how it's going to grow this EBITDA and, and, and you know, in a sustainable way on the long term. And this is really what's leading to the perhaps high valuation that people perceive in the market, especially for a small brand. But first, you know, not everybody gets that kind of multiple, and those who get the multiple are the, the best metric 
uh, where they you know where they exceed everyone else is the purity of the brand equity. Coming back to the question about whether you know the strategics you know uh, pay the highest price. Uh, uh, two things. First, they are not always invited at the table. You know, I think some people don't want them to be around the table because they fear that right. you know, yeah. they will lose their independence or whatever. That's true. Truth or you know, I don't know. Uh, and then I would say it's a bit like on a poker table. You know, I think the reality is when they are at the table, they usually have the best end. That's true. You know, they have the best end because of the operational you know, capabilities, the synergies. Uh, but they had to play it, and they had to play it well. And you know, it's not the only, you know, parameter I in the deal. Mm -hmm. um, and just to come back to the deal itself, I would say they have the best ability to, to make an ambitious business plan. They have the best mm -hmm. ability to perhaps push the business in new geographies. Uh, also comes with that, I would say, the big responsibility, the big risk uh, around integration, because yeah. it's one thing to, 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 to write an ambitious business plan, but then you need to deliver, and those are also also complex organization, you know, very global organization. So obviously they have a best end, but they need always to make the risk reward of how to play that end and making sure that beyond just the numbers, the way they've set up the deal in terms of aligning interest with the founders, you know, uh, you know, earnouts, you know, make sure that you know not only them but also the people staying in place, you know, have the same vision in terms of the business plan and delivering the value. Right. So, so again, going to the chase, we've talked about a little bit about valuation. I really want to go back on the time horizon, even though you have said, I think almost unanimously, that you're not really looking at luxury. You're still looking at a part of luxury. Maybe it's not absolute. And that requires time. So how, first Ron and maybe Virginie, but how do you reconcile this time horizon that doesn't always fit with the quick three-year churn model that some private equity groups really need to focus on so that they can go out and raise another fund and well, continue I the... Okay, I'll give you my two years of experience in this business. <laughs> and, but um, we, we're really lucky because uh, our firm, the founders of the firm, the two founders, are the largest investors in each fund. Okay. So they have True. patience. And, you know, they, these are the family that own Neiman Marcus for 18 years. So th they understand this business, they understand it doesn't happen overnight, and they have patience. And our LPs are generally, um, are for the most part, Ivy League endowment funds, who also don't have the, the rush of fast money. Mm -hmm. And when we do an evaluation, because every, you know, every book we get has got a hockey stick performance, and then we've got to kind of go through the hockey stick that we were given by the banker and uh, kind of <laughs> validate it or invalidate it, mostly invalidate it. And so, and then we will set our own timeline. We've set timelines of seven years. We have never set a timeline that I am aware of less than five years. If we can get out earlier than five years, then okay. it's good. But our decision to, to exit a brand is really to hand something off that is in really great shape. Okay. I mean, our reputation is much more important than the individual okay. deal we, we have. And we're prepared to hang in there for you know significant amounts of time to get the deal correct. Okay. And I know that uh, Virginie, with your long-term capital, you have the opportunity to stay. And I think you stayed with Montclair beyond. Yeah, the although it was very fast in Montclair, much faster right. than we anticipated. Uh, you know, to be honest, uh, we were probably you know three years earlier in achieving our target than we felt. Um, w then we thought initially when we invested, then you know we we uh, we IPO'd the company that was Remo Ruffini request right from the start, and you know. But you didn't exit entirely. But you're we still didn't there. exit entirely, right. and I think you know you have to continue. Yeah. That, that's you know it's uh, it's important. If also things don't go well, yeah. You know when everything goes well, time is less of the essence. Right. I think yes. Then, if you are facing a more difficult situation and uh, you know macro consumption environment, which may be more difficult, uh -huh. or if the company doesn't you know internationalize as fast as it needs, then you need to then just need make to sure that you're here for the long term and you can continue to fuel the growth right. and don't you know don't stop or block any decision making for the wrong reason, which would be your own your own time horizon. Right. I mean, I think what that we really say, yeah. destroy value right. uh, you know for the company. Um, and of course, and as a consequence for, for the shareholder you know, itself, of course. Because luxury does need patient capital. 
Uh, before we talk about exit, which is the final question, I just have one question for Peter. You mentioned earlier that you sometimes buy a minority. Uh, I would imagine that you also have a plan to, a path to control, um, because I don't imagine that you would continue long-term being a minority owner, is that correct? So uh, let me first uh, add uh, to what Laurent said. As a matter of fact, we're not always the highest bidder. A number of the deals we've been doing, we were not the highest bidder uh, <laughs> in the last couple of years, but we were the best overall package uh -huh. for the entrepreneurs. Make big difference, so, yes. Uh, I think there is increasingly, you know, people want the right home for their brands as well because they have a legacy, uh, and they want that legacy uh, to survive and to prosper. Uh, and I think that's really what we offer uh, at Estelot, at least I can you know, obviously only talk for, for beauty. Yes, if we uh, do make a minority investment, our pr uh, preference is to have a path to control, and the simple reason for that is, um, even in a minority investment, we uh, do uh, come uh, with a lot of knowledge, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of our time, um, and we really help the entrepreneurs to build their business. So obviously, you know, we would not want somebody else than to take that business Correct. over after yeah. we have you know, done all the work <laughs> and, and done all the work. So, so now talk about exits and I want to go to Joe and ask him a very pointed question about angel investors and what is their influence and ability to control exits at all? That's a good question. So you know there are a bunch of camps out there that talk about you know the desire for early exits. <laughs> Um, the and then what is the time horizon for you? So the reality, and an early exit would be, you know, three years. And that desire is not matched by any reality. Um, you know, the investment horizon, the real investment horizon is five to seven years. And the real first milestone is financial. It's at what point do we start having, you know, an EBITDA number that is alive and we are positive cash flow. And if you, if you expect, you know, in fewer than three years to be cash flow positive, that's naive. So the you know horizon number one cash flow positive, um, exit horizon is five to seven. Now, if if you're looking at emerging, um, which is the business that we're in, um, you're looking about growing you know ten, twenty, thirty x depending on on how early stage you are. Um, you know that's value formation, and 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 that work is hard, and that work um, you know takes time, and you know you know when you've accomplished that, you've kind of grown out of your angel. You've grown out of your early stage company, your early stage investors. And so at that point, it begins to make sense to think about exits. Now, you know, that's the investor's perspective. The investor's perspective is also founders first. It's got to make sense for the founder. Um, you know, we like to see our founders over 60% when we invest, no less. We like to see them exit still holding 40 if we've done our job right, because we haven't done too many up rounds, we haven't diluted their position. Um, you know, 40% at a cash flow positive, solid business, um, where we're now in year six and we're looking for a strategic to pay a nice healthy multiple for the hard work that's been done, that's great for the founder. It's also great for us. Yeah. So, you know, influence, depends on the governance that we set up. We have lots of negative power. We can prevent bad things from happening. We can prevent the wrong deals from happening. We can't make the right deals happen if it's not right for the founder. So. The influence is more about you know uh, making sure something bad doesn't happen, um, and then sort of opening the door to the good and hope that it works for the founder. But it's really got to work for the founder. Otherwise, our reputation for being founder friendly and delivering on that promise to the founders, right. we don't we don't you know our funnel dries up. We don't want that to happen. We don't want that. To okay. Happen. So the final is just uh, we talked a little bit when we were preparing for the panel about exits and what are the preferred exits and. Um, I've obviously, IPO is one, but honestly, when I look also at the Sandro Mage deal that was just announced, I often think that IPOs are used as a, hey, deep-pocketed buyers, this is your opportunity, come and buy it, and not always, I can see Virginie's not happy, but if you put yourself in the place of KKR when they brought Sandro Mage and they announced we're going to do an IPO, and they got taken out at, I don't know, how many X, 2X by a Chinese buyer? It's a, it's a great exit. So just share in final your, your comments, uh, Ron and, and Virginie, on... No, and just on Laurent. IPO, because of course it, it, it's, it's, it fits, you know, a certain category of, of companies. I, I, I've got, uh, you know, expertise for many, many years um, with publicly quoted companies. Eurasio itself is a publicly quoted company. I've got a great belief that uh, only a few companies 
can actually go to the market and survive right, for the long term right. an IPO. Uh, um, deep belief. I think Montclair, back in 2011, wasn't prepared, absolutely not prepared. And it's a good thing they did not manage, also because I could invest and made a, a made tremendous investment. <laughs> but more seriously, it was a good thing they didn't manage. I think they were much better prepared down the road for many different reasons. You have to be very secure, more international, all the process in place. You know, once you're IPO, once you're public, you know, th there's no way you can get out of the right. stock exchange. Um, and I think it's only a specific, you know, specific profile for which that exit is suited. And you need to make sure also that some reference shareholders stay there for the long term to also make sure that the company is well protected for a certain period of time. You know, it's a form of maturity going forward. So not all those companies can go to IPOs for sure. So the exits would be corporate or would be other other investor for another, you know, another round of growth and transformation. But when you organize your exits in Toronto, Virginie, um, if you have an inbound from a great strategic, do you spend two minutes at least thinking about should I do the process and organize it and make sure I squeeze the last dollar or should I go with this strategic? We had so an inbound on Montclair four months before IPO. I guess the answer was no. And we turn it down. <laughs> I was the one to turn it down, yeah. of course, discussing it with... Is it fair to say that there are not that many Montclair? Would you not agree that Montclair is an exceptional company in many I, aspects? I, I agree it's an exceptional company. I wish there was you know, many more Montclair, and, and yeah. I'm sure there are many more Montclair coming you know, through <laughs> the, 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 the pipe. I mean, Montclair, when we invested, and you know, some people in the room know the situation very well, was only um, 180, yeah, the Montclair brand yeah, yeah. was 180 million euro. That was 2011. Uh, when our friend from Carlyle invested, it was probably you know 100 million euros. So this company uh, has been growing extremely fast over a very short period of time. So we we know, represented there uh, will be other Montclair. We represented an investor in 2008 that had the opportunity to invest in Montclair, and he wasn't sure of the growth story. Of course, you know when we and invested, and we were yeah. told you know you're paying a hell of a, a, a multiple. You must be crazy. This exactly. is a fashion brand, a luxury. And you know this is the top. It's not going to grow more. And exactly. you know, hopefully, we all not have the same view on a situation. Otherwise, Otherwise it would we be will <laughs> all be fighting, you know, for the same opportunity. You know, thanks God, you have your own judgment. And you you can have luck as well sometimes. That life. helps. And um, you know that plays um, that plays to grow. Those I, I've been around. told that luck comes to a lot of hard work. The more you work, the luckier you can get. But I don't know if that's true. <laughs> Ron, did you have any final well, comments? Um, with uh, Castaway, generally our exit strategies to a strategic, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, the, the kind of mid-stage partner where we bring a number of operators like myself, we have somebody in beauty, somebody in digital, somebody in HR and legal, somebody in operations and finance. So we bring a lot of support to the brands, get them organized in a certain way, get them on that success pattern. And generally, we want to same as Joe was saying, I mean, we, we really work with the founders. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are the guys we, we want to support, and make successful, and have them make, a, make money. And we generally will move to a strategic because they're best people mm -hmm. to handle a company the larger size than, than mm -hmm. we are. Any final comments now that we're very, very late? Go ahead, Laurent. Yeah, quickly, I think uh, on two things. Uh, first, uh, the, the side, you know, when you need uh, to consider a partner, and that's more also for the entrepreneurs in the room. Uh, I think it's before you absolutely need it. Yeah, of course. That's, we are in many cases called, but it's too late, mm -hmm. or we don't have time, or it's emergency, so, so just don't do that. You see the cycle, so you know, prepare for the next cycle, see if you have the needs, if you have the capital, if you have the resources, the talents, all this can be bought. And we've talked a lot about smart money, and perhaps to come back to one of the Peter's point is, I think smart money and people are getting smarter, investors are getting smarter. Don't underestimate uh, the, the, the potential of, you know, just the, the basic connection with the brand, the people, you know. Uh, once, I, you know, and again, I work for ST on some uh, transaction, you know, you have the ability to, to, to connect with the brand, to connect with the founders has led them to pay a good price, but, you know, really make sure that they're gonna create value on the long term. And this very basic element is still, you know, for me, perhaps 50% of the reason why a, a deal is succeeding or failing, actually. It's what we call it, the art and not the science of the deal. It's exactly so that. I think in closing, what I notice is a lot of the very, very cool brands that have been created since the last great recession, they have never been through 
a recession. They don't understand cycles, many of them. And to the point about what's the right time, what I worry about now, day in, day out, is when I see these companies and they think they're on a path and a trajectory and nothing's going to hurt them and they're going to keep extrapolating what they've done and more, because you're always more optimistic about tomorrow, and they're missing an opportunity. I think right now, this year, is a great time to think about solidifying your position and finding the right partner, hopefully one of us. Thank you, everyone.